Hey everyone, and welcome to the 52nd episode of the Liam McCollum Show. All right, so I have a previous episode with Balin Linekin from Reason Magazine talking about food sustainability and all of these regulations from the USDA that, that really cause shortages when, when systems start to crumble. So um, I'm really interested in food sustainability and I figured I would bring someone on locally to talk about the issue here in Montana and what we're dealing with here. I'll actually link to that podcast if you want to listen to it just for some background and how the USDA regulations affect states and cause shortages. So that podcast will be linked in the description. But today I've got Senator Greg Hertz from Montana to talk about the food freedom bill that he sponsored and got passed through the Montana legislature this last session. The bill was originally targeted at those USDA regulations, but it got some pushback and had to be amended. It specifically focuses on state and county regulations that increase prices and make it difficult for people to start small businesses. I will say that in libertarian circles, there is kind of this question of subsidiarity and whether states should get involved in county decisions. No, I tend to agree with that. I'm supportive of Senator Hertz challenging the USDA and state regulations. Either way, this conversation about how regulations always hurt the little guy needs to continue to be a conversation, especially in more regulated counties like Gallatin and Missoula. So I really hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Um, We're starting to see the effects of these regulations, especially now when systems all across the country are starting to uh, fall apart, including in housing. Um, Another thing that hurts and I talked about after is, you know, the shortage in in housing that we're seeing and these zoning regulations that occur in Missoula and Gallatin. Um, And that's a podcast that I want to do in the future. So I hope you guys enjoy this podcast and definitely reach out to Senator Hertz if you have any questions. I'll link to his information in the description. But here he is. Senator Hertz, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to come here and talk to you about food freedom in Montana. Yeah, it's a pleasure for me too. Are you finished up at the Capitol right now? You guys are done, right? Yeah, we finished up um, the end of April. And so we're just heading into the interim here and hopefully we won't have to go back in the special session. Cool. Well, yeah, I wanted to bring you on to talk about Senate Bill 199. But before we do that, um, do you want to just introduce yourself, tell people maybe where you represent, how long you've been in uh, at the Capitol there and just a little background about you? Sure. Yeah, I've um, lived on the shores of Flathead Lake most of my life. Uh, I first started in the legislature in 2013, so this is my fifth session. Um, From a background standpoint, uh, I am a CPA. I practiced public accounting for about 10 years in the 80s, and then in 89, I started in the um, food business. I've been in the grocery business for over 30 years and um, serve... uh, Western Montana. I have five stores in Montana and one in North Idaho. Yeah. And then now you introduced and sponsored this bill, uh, Senate Bill 199. And just a little bit about your story. I know that you saw the Cottage Foods Bill of 2015 that was introduced and I believe was passed and you just wanted to go further. Um, You did get a warning from the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service. uh, So maybe you were doing something right. But do you want to just explain why you got behind this bill? Sure. So being in the grocery business, I had a lot of customers just asking me for more locally produced food. And um, it's not always easy to do that in the retail environment that we have and the centralized uh, processing and inspection. So in 2015, um, there were some legislators working on the cottage food bill, which kind of opened the door a little bit and allowed people to use their home kitchens to um, get into some retailing of food, but not a whole lot. At the same time, um, Tyler Lindholm, a uh, representative in Wyoming, was working on Wyoming's food, free bi- food freedom bill. Um, I kind of refer to Wyoming as the uh, wild west of food freedom. Pretty much anything goes down in Wyoming. So I had looked at that bill and um, that kind of morphed into um, this bill that I brought during this session. I also brought this bill in 2017 and made it through the House, but it died in the Senate. So made it a lot far, farther this time, and uh, it was great to get it done. Yeah, to talk about what the bill does, I think it might be helpful just if people understand what the regulations were like before this bill was introduced. Um, how difficult was it for small businesses? I know some people are saying that this bill will save them thousands of dollars. Yeah, so this bill right now is directly impacts um, an individual selling to the end 
user. So basically you can sell food that you prepare with the exception of some meat, which we can discuss a little bit later about the USDA's problem. But um, it allows the, you to sell something that you might have produced at your home in your home kitchen on your farm or ranch. You can sell it directly to the end consumer. You have to warn them that, hey, look, this food has not been inspected. There's no labels on it. And um, you can um, meet them at their house, your house, in a um, agreed upon location or a community social event, which is basically, um, as we described in the bill, a farmer's market. So you can sell this stuff at the uh, local farmer's market to, um, to people and they can get them local food. And then what is the argument against food freedom? I guess, where did the pushback come from? I, I'm sure a lot of it was paternalistic, but I'm sure there are also some other motivations too. Yeah, so a lot of it had to do with um, health inspectors. Um, for some reason, they seem to think that people aren't capable of producing um, good quality, safe food within their homes. So we've been doing it for thousands of years um, it happens all the time at um, potlucks in our communities that, um, where you just have your neighbors over and serve them food. Um, we're not getting sick or making people sick from doing that. So that was the biggest pushback. Um, and also they, they seem to think that with all this centralized uh, food processing and control that um, they're doing things safer, which to me, that's just the opposite. You know, I've been in the food industry for over 30 years. I see all kinds of recalls coming. We see these bad, um, you know, break breakouts of either it's E. coli um, in, in major food processing. I think the most one most recently had to do with the uh, romaine lettuce, where a lot of us figured out how much romaine lettuce was uh, being used all across in different types of salads. That was a really unique um, outbreak where uh, a romaine lettuce, large commercial farm was located next to a um, processing center um, and a livestock facility where some E. coli had gotten to the irrigation water and had basically ran over into the, um, the uh, romaine lettuce farm. And all of a sudden the romaine lettuce just sucked up the E. coli into its um, lettuce which was rather unique. Usually things like E. coli and other bacteria is on top of different products and you can either usually cook it or clean it off. This was not the case. So um, things like that would never happen at a local farm or ranch because um, you're not gonna have a large irrigation um, facility that's connected to um, maybe a feedlot that's feeding into um, your, your facility. And it's easier to, to track you know, smaller outbreaks and um, these large outbreaks that um, spread all across the country, you don't know where things went, who ate it, um, you destroy a lot of product where in a smaller facility, it's really easy to um, track if you did have an outbreak um, where it might have ended up at. Yeah, and just to spell out a little bit more about how, I guess, restrictive the regulations are, do you know of any, I guess, stories of people who have had to spend thousands of dollars just to come to market or I guess what does it look like what what was the process like before this bill yeah so I mean previously there was a huge black market that was going on from neighbors selling food to each other probably the biggest one had to do with raw milk um, a lot of people um, like to use raw milk it's got very good um, it's got good bacteria in it that'll help your health if you got certain problems and um, so that was one of the the main things that I had looked at. There's also, if you look around, there's a lot of people in your communities that are either selling things like wedding cakes, um, they're providing pies and stuff down to the local restaurants, um, cookies, all of that's illegal. Um, a lot of people don't even know it's illegal, but um, that is kind of where the cottage food bill came in in 2015. However, there's a huge amount of regulations in the cottage food bill that just don't make any sense. It's not making us safer. Um, what, what we've done in this country is we've seemed to have traded um, food safety for food quality. And um, it's, it's unfortunate and we've consolidated a lot of things. But so with this bill right now, like I said at the beginning, you can sell to your neighbors or the end user. This bill doesn't go as far as allowing 
you to produce something in your home kitchen and then go sell it at a local retailer or sell it to a local restaurant. I think that's something that we'll look at going down the road to expand. Wyoming has started to expand this down there as has a few other states, North Dakota, um, Utah, Maine, and a, and a few other states. And there's a lot of states looking at that. And I think as they roll this out and they see that, hey, people aren't going to make other people sick just by producing something in their home, that we'll see a lot of this expand and hopefully we can break down some of the, the health officials and, and their concerns. Yeah, and I think a lot of people can kind of resonate with the sentiment here because there are a lot of stories from all across the country of people like just children getting the cops called on them for, you know, selling lemonade right corner or something so i do think that it's a sentiment that a lot of people can support um but you did reference the meat inspection and stuff like that and i know that you had originally planned on touching the meat the, the usda inspection act i believe is what it is the federal meat inspection act um and i think that that would be really important just based off of last year's shortages sh shortages i had a few people on my podcast to talk about it um balen Linekin, from Reason Magazine was on. And he was essentially just saying the fewer regulations we have, the more sustainable our food systems are. Um, and I will link to that podcast for the listener if, if they wanna um, listen to that podcast. But essentially he argues that the feds don't even have a legit claim to regulate intrastate commerce in general. They regulate interstate commerce, but within the state, you know, that's a whole nother issue. So would you have wanted to go further and actually get into that? Yeah, I would. and. Um, probably look at that, but it is a federal issue. And so even though the states don't regulate what happens within a state, um, they, they can cross, when you cross state lines, but what they hold over your head is money. And so Montana and most states have a um, statewide inspection for um, processing plants and interstate um, commerce. And this, the federal government matches that um, 50%. So when I first got the fiscal note on the bill, um, it was Montana was going to lose a million dollars in matching federal dollars. And um, of course, that upset a lot of people. And there, there's no way that. So what I had to do was um, put some amendments on the bill. I worked with the Department of Livestock to make sure that they did not lose their federal funding um, for their inspections. But it's still what happens with particular bills and like this one, the feds still control um, meat that is inspected and processed at a USDA or a state inspected facility. And so even in this bill, if let's say you make the best lasagna in the state out of your home and you go down to the local grocery store and buy beef for your lasagna that's already been inspected at a USDA plant, um, this bill still does not allow you to use that meat, prepare it in your home kitchen, and then sell it down at the farmer's market. It's um, something that I'm working with our um, congressional uh, individuals and our US senators on trying to loosen up that regulation because it only makes sense. I mean, if, if the foods and the meat's already been processed at a USDA facility, why can't you then further process it at home? But um, if we were to allow that, it would take away that um, million dollar of matching inspection money. And um, it's, you know, in, in other states, it's a lot more money than what Montana is doing. So it's unfortunate, um, but hopefully we can break down that barrier because you're right. I mean, we, we did see shortages across the country and um, a lot of it has to do with our highly centralized processing. There's only four major meatpacking plants right now in the United States where um, one of those breaks down, it really causes a problem in the supply chain. So we really need to um, make sure that our food is produced locally and you can get it like, you know, 40, 50 years ago, most of Montana's food was actually produced and processed in the state. And that has pretty much dwindled down to a very small amount of what's processed here in Montana. Yeah. And is part of the problem there that you need like a certified inspector in the plant? Do you know what the problem is there? Yeah, so USDA inspected, federally inspected plants require an inspector to come in and look at their plants on a regular basis. We do have um, several USDA inspected plants. In fact, there's one here in Ronan, um, Montana, not far from Polson, that has been a USDA inspected plant for a number of years. But they're 
they're dwindling down because the cost associated with that is excessive. Um, some of the equipment that you have to have in there is excessive and it doesn't um, pencil out um, if you're trying to uh, make a living doing that. So we do have a number of state inspected plants um, that have a little less onerous um, inspection rules on them. And, you know, the food quality is just as good there. And so that's another process we're working on right now. Um, trying to work on a compact between states, um, like it, be, it might be North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, where our state inspected plants um, will enter into an agreement to allow us to move food across state lines from those state inspected plants. But as you can guess, the USDA does not like that. And they're pushing back really hard on um, states trying to enter into a compact. Yeah, I'm sure not, but that sounds really awesome. I would totally get behind that. And we, you know, there are cases of um, Democrat states or blue states who try to enter into compacts too. Like there was talk of it. I know um, if, I think there was a claim that if Donald Trump didn't, if, if Donald Trump um, didn't concede the election, California and Oregon would have entered into a compact. So, I mean, we have precedents here. It's not just something that, you know, red states do, but um, I'm, I'm just curious, is there any other area that you'd like to go into other than just this? Like, are, is there any other than the compact and, and this bill and the USDA Federal Meat Inspection Act, are there, is there anywhere else that you would like to get into? Well, you know, what I'd like to see is um, expand food freedom maybe in the next session that allows um, people to actually start selling into a retail environment. Um, I have no problem. If you do that, you probably need to start putting some labels on it and more information, but that would be up to the processor. Uh, we could also open up the cottage food um, bill a little bit more. They can do that now, but it's only with what they classify as non-hazardous food, things like bread, um, cookies, cakes with no cream in them. Um, the cottage food bill even went so far um, where you could sell coffee down at the farmer's market, but you could not add, have fresh cream there to put into the coffee. You had to use this fake creamer you know, stuff that has is highly processed, has got a lot of additives in it. And that's another problem with what's going on with the USDA. I mean, a lot of the food that we're consuming has a lot of additives in it. It's got a lot of processing in it. Our cancer rates have gone off the charts in the last 30 years. And to me, it's it's what we're putting into our bodies. And so what I, part of this bill too, is helping people eat more healthy foods. And um, that's a, one thing that we need to continue to work on and something, even though I'm in the grocery industry and I sell a lot of that highly processed food, mm -hmm. um, but people still want it and, and there's a demand for it. So we should make it easier for them to um, get those type of foods. Yeah. And I, I just read here, um, there's one more part of your bill that I found interesting. So it allows the sale and consumption of homage food and food products and to encourage sales by ranches, but then a person who slaughters livestock or poultry or prepares or processes livestock or poultry products for the person's own personal or household usage is allowed. Is, was it really the case that before this bill that wasn't allowed or is that just something that was added? That's just kind of clarifying okay. um, things. So what this bill does allow, so if, if you're a rancher and you raise cattle, if you take um, one of your... Um, steers down to the local processing facility and have it processed um, you can and then freeze you can take that down to the farmer's market and sell it there um, the frozen um, the product or even fresh product or um, arrange for someone to um, get it but you cannot process that at your own ranch um, although there's a number of individuals i mean for a long time in montana i mean Heck, when I go and shoot a deer or an elk, sometimes, you know, like we're carving it up in the garage mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. Although you can't be carving something up when it's 80 degrees out, um, you know, and generally that's not during hunting season. So you need to take a few safeguards and on doing that, but um, that should be allowed that you should just be able to trade and, and sell food between your neighbors. Now, one thing in the bill has to do with um, poultry. Um, the federal government has created an exemption. If you're raising 1,000 or less um, poultry a year, 
you can actually process those and freeze them at your own home and sell those to your neighbors. And you can sell that down at the farmer's market too. And you can also make um, chicken lasagna out of that. So if you make a, a good chicken chili or lasagna, you could go down to the farmer's market and sell that too. So it seems rather odd that they'll let you do it for poultry, mm -hmm. but not for beef. And for poultry has a tendency to grow bacteria very fast if you don't get it very clean. So it's really odd that they um, allow poultry, which has a higher bacterial content than, than beef might. So it's, it's kind of odd. It's typical federal government and the state government on some of the stuff that they will allow you and not allow you to do. Yeah, and then just a little more about um, who these regulations or the exemptions might not apply to. So you define small dairy as, um, I fiber. You have five or less lactating cows or 10 or less lactating sheep or um, goats. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. Well, is there any other part of this bill that you want to talk to that maybe talk about that we didn't touch on? Um, I think I've gone through all of my notes, but if there's anything else you want to bring it up really quick. Yeah. So the only other thing is there, you know, we did put in traditional community social events. Um, which, you know, are your weddings and funerals or everybody does a potluck. It also included, um, you know, sports. Um, you know, you might have a fundraiser for the Little League team or the girls softball team where you're selling, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs down there. And basically this bill, um, it was always, you know, probably 15 years ago, there was never a problem. It just seems like in the last 10 or 15 years, all of a sudden the health department shows up down at the local fundraiser. And this bill just basically said, hey, no, you need to stay out of that. These are just one-time events that you don't need to get involved. These people do not need a license to be selling hamburgers and cooking them on a grill and, and doing different things like that. And so that kind of just kind of told the health department, hey, back off. You know, in some counties, they weren't even bothering but you get into some of your other more high, highly regulated counties, such as Gallatin County, Missoula County. Um, they were just, you know, coming down and, and pushing back on, on nonprofits, just trying to raise a little bit of money for their um, community. You might've been a church social or something like that. So um, that kind of just drew a line in the sand that said, hey, you know, stay away from these people. Although what I'm seeing right now is there's some pushback from local sanitarians. They don't like this bill, took, took away a little bit of their control. So they're providing a lot of false information out there to um, individuals that is, is not accurate. Um, I suspect there's gonna be some pushback at some farmer's markets. Um, that'll be interesting because I know a lot of our farmer's markets are run on public property. So if you do something on private property, I mean, that's up to you who you want at your farmer's market, who you want to sell. But if you're at a public on public property at a farmer's market, you best not be telling people that, hey, you can't come down here and sell your homemade food and um, be interesting to see how that happens and, and what happens. But um, it's unfortunate. I wish these um, local sanitarians would get behind this bill. Another big disappointment had to do with um, some of our agricultural um, promotional type nonprofits who fought the bill too, which, you know, if you look at some of their websites, um, like Arrow, which is a um, nonprofit, I think kind of based out of Bozeman, they talk about sustainable food, uh, making sure that people are growing food locally. They can help our farmers and ranchers. Everything in this bill fits in their mission statements, yet they fought the bill because they don't believe that um, a local producer can make something safe. It's unfortunate. Yeah, I was going to actually bring up that point earlier that, you know, everyone seems to argue for sustainable systems or buying local, especially, you know, more left leaning places, but they seem to be opposed to getting rid of these regulations that kind of restrict localities. But I was just wondering, um, so you mentioned how this kind of uh, targeted um, local regulations as well. So is it local regulations as well as state regulations that, that this bill kind of curbed? Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting to look at the bill. When I first looked at Wyoming's bill, it was a two page bill um, and they have less regulations. But then uh, my bill turned into know, 28 pages and the first four pages just talk about you know what you can do. But the other pages are basically just telling the government what you cannot do. 
and you cannot regulate any of this. You can't require packaging. You can't require labels. You cannot, <clears throat> excuse me, inspect it. So that's, um, you know, it's pretty much from the state government down to local governments. They get they need to stay out of the inspection of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would love to see some more pushback at, you know, the federal level in the future. And I hope you keep doing what you're doing. But if there's anything else that you want to say, um, please do. And then we can let you go. No, um, it's just been great. You know, I encourage people to, um, you know, if they have any questions, I've had a lot of people call me. I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to sit down and talk to people about this. And um, hopefully I'm going to start reaching out to some of these other organizations and, and hopefully I'll get behind it and make sure that we have more sustainable food in the state of Montana. Yeah. Well, if you want to tell people where they can actually reach out to you, that would be awesome. <clears throat> Sure. So, I mean, you can always email me on my legislative website. It's just um, greg.hertz at mtledge.gov, or they can find information too on those websites. And it's got my other contact information, my cell phone's on there. And I'm always willing to talk to anybody about this or any other subjects. Cool. Well, yeah, thank you so much. And I'll definitely link to that stuff in the description of the video as well. So. Um, All right. I really appreciated talking to you. This was awesome. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's the weekend and we can let go. It's the full send and it's the get-go.